Okay, today we're, what we're going to be doing is looking at 11-5, day one, the area problem. Um, we learned this back in Algebra 2 and uh, reviewed that um, earlier this year, that when we have the sum of an infinite geometric sequence, um, that as long as the our R value is less than, well, between negative 1 and 1, as long as the absolute value of R is less than 1, then we can use this. Um, let's think about rewriting using the limit notation. What we're really doing when we're finding the sum is we're finding the sum, or we're going to take the limit as n approaches infinity of the sum of this geometric rule. And because there are so many n's right here, I am going to use i as an index. So essentially, this is our geometric rule, a sub 1 times r to the i minus 1. And we're going from 1 to n, but we're approaching infinity. And we know that the rule for the finite sum was where we took a sub 1 times 1 minus r to the n over 1 minus r. Um, but one thing to keep in mind right now is that the absolute value of r is less than 1. And so what that means here is that the limit as n approaches infinity of r to the n, if r is indeed less than 1, is going to be 0. And so this is really like 1 minus 0, if we're approaching infinity, um, times a sub 1 over 1 minus r. And so that gives us that a sub 1 over 1 minus r. So that's where that comes from. Um, we're going to use some um, other summation formulas and um, properties. Um, we'll kind of use them throughout here, um, but just a little review of what summation notation is. When we see that, when we see the summation notation, um, here we're going to have a rule, and um, we are going to be using that i as an index. And the reason is because i is going to be our variable, and then n is going to represent the upper limit of summation in that case. So again, this n is the upper limit of summation. So n is a numerical value. And then, of course, um, i equals 1 is going to be the lower limit of summation. And so again, in these questions, when we're going forward, i is going to be the variable. And just one important thing throughout this, n is going to be a constant. And remember that when we think about properties of um, sums, what we can do is we can uh, factor that out. Um, so again, that's very important for us when we get to something like number six, that if we do have a constant value, we're able to take that out. So we'll kind of use that in the next couple of days. Um, you guys will be able to use a sheet like this. Um, you'll be able to use the summation formulas and properties. Um, so you guys will get this. And the other thing that I'm going to allow you to do is to um, simplify these different pieces. So this n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, I'm just going to let you know, that can simplify to 2n cubed plus 3n squared plus n. And this n squared times the quantity um, n plus 1 squared is going to be n to the fourth plus 2n cubed plus n squared. That like basically we can um, simplify that. And as we go forward in this particular section, you'll see why it's kind of handy for us to have those multiplied out already. Okay. Um, but those are the summation formulas. And why don't we just kind of practice using them? Um, and we'll look at do that in example one. In example one, it wants us to evaluate the sum of i from 1 to 200. Um, and of course, that means that we're adding 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way up to 200. Well, there is a rule for this. And look at this rule here. We can use formula 2. So we can use formula 2, and what that means is that we're going to go that the sum of 1 to 200 of i is going to be n. And notice our n right here is the value in the formula. Okay. 
okay? So what we'll actually be doing is putting 200 in for n, and then 200 plus 1 would be 201, and then over 2. So again, formula 2 was that when we see the sum of 1 to n of i, then we can use this, n times n plus 1 over 2. So we just substitute those values in, and we get that our sum is 20,100, and that's our answer, okay? Let's say that we had um, letter B. Now, in letter B, we have a different index of summation. Notice that we have J as the index of summation, but it will follow all the same rules as using that I as an index of summation. So first, let's use the properties um, of the summation. Notice that we're able to, if we have a sum, to separate those. So I could separate that into the sum from 1 to 10 of j cubed, and then I could subtract this off. Well, let's feed two birds with one feeder, and also notice that there's a constant in front. And so instead of subtracting just the sum of 3j squared, I'm going to pull out that 3, and I'm just going to take the sum of j squared from 1 to 10 as well. And so um, what we can do is use this idea of the j cubed. Um, and when we're using numbers, I think it's easier to put it, to keep it in the um, factored notation. But what we can do here is use formula four. And formula four says that when we have the sum of one to n of i cubed, so in this case j cubed, we're going to take n, which is 10, and we're going to square it. Now we have n plus 1, so 10 plus 1 is 11 squared, and then all over 4. Now I have minus 3, and now I want to use, I have this j squared, so that tells me I'm going to use formula 3. And so when I'm going from 1 to n of for i squared, that means that I'm going to take n, which is 10, times n plus 1, so that's 11, and then times 2n plus 1, so 2 times 10 is 20, plus 1 is 21, and this one is all over 6. Okay. Then you could just put that in your calculator. Here we end up with 3,025 minus 1155, and then that would give us 1,870 as our sum, okay? Now, in example two, they're asking us to look at this and evaluate for a bunch of different values of n. Um, so that's going to be kind of annoying unless we just have it in terms of n only, and then we can substitute that in. So in this, I think it's going to be best um, we're going to want the summation formula um, in terms of n only. That way we can have a little general rule, and then we can just substitute the specific values of n in that we want. All right. So if we take a look at that, we have the sum from 1 to n of i plus 2 over n squared. And let's use our um, summation uh, properties to help us out. Now, remember, this n squared, this n squared is a constant. So what we could do is pull that out. So I could write that as 1 over n squared, and then I can still take the sum of 1 to n of, uh, from 1 to n of i plus 2. And then I can further use the properties of summation and separate this out. I can take the sum from 1 to n of i and take the sum from um, 1 to n of 2. And then it's at this point that I can use the different formulas. Okay. So if I look here, um, I can keep this 1 over n squared. And now I want to utilize the formula for um, when it's just i here. And so what we can have here is that this formula is going to be n 
times n plus 1 over 2 when we're going from 1 to n. And so here we have, um, we can um, substitute this with n times n plus 1 over 2. And then here we have this 2 that's here. And if we have the sum of 1 to n of some constant c, then it's just c times n. So here, because I have the sum from 1 to n of 2, that means that's just going to be 2n. Okay. And so now let's make a, um, maybe simplify that a little bit. I can apply that n squared to both of those. So like here, one of the n's is going to cancel, and I'm just left with n plus 1 over 2n. And if I distribute here, one of the n cancels, and I'm left with 2 over n. Um, then I could make a common denominator by multiplying by 2 so over 2. So I get n plus 1 over 2n plus 3. 4 over 2n. So as a rule, I end up with n plus 5 over 2n. So that's going to be my general rule. And so now what I can do, now that I have those specific, that specific um, rule, now it's easy for us to evaluate s sub n at specific values. So the values that they wanted is they wanted us to evaluate s sub 10, which means I'm just going to substitute 10 into this rule. They wanted me to evaluate s sub 100, so I'm going to substitute 100 into this rule. The same thing with s sub 1000 and with s sub 10,000. Okay, so we can just substitute those specific values in. Of course, um, we could try use our calculator to help us out, um, but this gives us 15 over 20, which simplifies to 3 fourths. This ends up simplifying to 21 fortieths. This is 201 over 400. Guess is what this is going to be, 2001 over 4,000, and those would be the specific values. So you can see that it's nice when we are able to get um, a specific formula for n um, or for the, for the sum, and then we can find a bunch of different values that way. Okay. Um, so again, this is what it says here, is that notice in the last example, it was more convenient to um, convert this into rational form and then substitute the appropriate values for n versus evaluating the each, each sum. And that's what we're basically going to be doing, is oftentimes converting to rational form um, and then substituting the appropriate values in. And so that's going to be good. This idea of converting it into rational form will be good for us when we are doing um, these next couple problems, which is asking us to rewrite the sum as a rational function, s sub n, and then find the limit of s of n as n approaches infinity. So let's try to do that. So we have this um, s of n, and that is going to be, it wants a rule as a, as a function, a rule for the sum of 1 to n of 2i plus 3 over n squared. Well, again, n squared, remember, is a constant, so we can pull that out. So we can pull that out, and now we're going from... 1 to n of 2i plus 3. Okay, so then again what I can do is separate this into two different parts using the properties of summation. And then now at this point I can find the specific values or the, um, the rules. So here what I have is I can think about pulling this out. So if you want, we can think about putting that 2 on the outside here. And so what we would want to do is we would want to use the rule 
from 1 to n of i. And we can see that that is the n times n plus, uh, plus 1. Um, and then this one is pretty easy to do. This is um, kind of nice to rewrite just as n squared plus n over 2. You'll see why um, when you go forward. Okay. And then here, now we have the sum of 1 to n of 3. And remember, when we're just taking the sum of 1 to n of a constant, then that's just going to be 3n. Um, and then we just simplify. So I can see that these twos cancel. Um, and so I have 1 over n squared. And then I have n squared plus n plus 3n, which is n squared plus 4n. And so I end up with n squared plus 4n all over n squared. So that's going to be a rule. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's going to be a rule for my um, S of N, okay? So now that I have that rule, now what I'm able to do is I'm able to take the limit as N approaches infinity of S of N, okay? So essentially, then we're going to use this N squared plus 4N over N squared. And the nice thing about limits at infinity with rational functions is we can use those um, those rules. And so we know that because the degrees are the same, we'll divide our coefficients. And so our answer would just be one. Okay. Um, so let's try another one. Um, in letter B, this one wants us to find um, the sum, like a rule for the sum, when we have one to n of all of this, one plus i over n squared times one over n. Well, let's maybe try to simplify this a little bit. Um, so one thing that might be a little better for us is for us to have it in the rational form is to create like a fraction for us to deal with at first anyway. So let me try to make a common denominator for this portion. So I'd have to multiply by n over n. So that would give me n plus i over n squared times 1 over n. I mean, then this way it's easier for us to pull out the n's and plug that kind of stuff, okay? Um, so then we could flush this out a little bit. And so this would be n squared plus 2ni plus i squared all over n squared times 1 over n. And so another way that we could look at this is to go from oops, to go from 1 to n. And then our numerator is n squared plus 2ni plus i squared. And then n squared times n gives us n cubed here. So essentially, we're um, just turning that into um, a rational function. And then what we'll do is we'll separate this into, two, into different pieces. What we can do is apply this n cubed to each of these. Um, and of course, we could factor it out. There are so many different ways that you could do this. Um, I've tried a couple different ways. And the reason I'm not factoring it out for these more complicated problems, um, again, is just because I found that it, in the long run, this ends up being pretty nice. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to distribute this to each of the different pieces here. So this is going to be the sum from 1 to n of n squared over n cubed. And now I'll take that sum of 2ni over n cubed. And now I'll take the sum of 1 to n of i squared over n cubed. Okay. So I'm just I'm separating that into three different terms and then dealing with it that way. Okay. When I think about that, this is really a constant that's right here. So I can factor out that constant, and this is really multiplied by 1. So um, what I can do is think about the n squared over n cubed as the constant I pull out. 
And now I'm going to take the sum of 1 to n of 1. And then again, that's just whatever, when it's a constant, it's just the constant times n. So that's going to be times n. Okay. Now this time, this is a constant. So I can factor that out of out front, 2n over n cubed. But now I want to use the sum from 1 to n of i. Remember that that was n squared plus n all over 2. And then here I have 1 over n cubed that I can factor out. And then I can use the rule for i squared. And the rule for i squared is the 2n cubed plus 3n squared plus n all over 6. And again, you're going to be given this sheet. You do not have to memorize these summation formulas and properties. You'll be able to utilize those, okay? Um, and so now what we can do is try to get um, to simplify this a little bit. So now at this point, I have n cubed over n cubed. Here I have 2n cubed plus 2n squared squared over 2n cubed. And then here I have 2n cubed plus 3n squared plus n all over 6. n cubed. There's the n cubed over here. Okay, so now we would need a common denominator. And so um, my LCD is going to be 6n cubed. So this is missing a 6. This is missing a 3. And then this one, we're good. Okay. So then I end up with, if this is all going to be over 6n cubed. So this is 6n cubed plus another 6n cubed plus a 6n squared. And then all these stay the same, plus 2n cubed plus 3n squared plus n all over 6n cubed. Then we can combine our like terms together. So I have um, 6n cubed, 6n cubed, and 2n cubed is 14n cubed. 6n squared and 3n squared is 9n squared. And then I have plus n all over 6n cubed. So that represents a formula for the sum of those n terms. And now what I want to do, the second thing is that the second thing I want to do is take the limit of this sum. So I want to take the limit as n approaches infinity of this 14n cubed plus 9n squared plus n all over 6n cubed. And because, okay, I do want to say I know that we could um, simplify this and factor out the n's. Um, it's just not like it's going to give us the same answer. So as long as we get it in some sort of rational form, I, I'm, I'm good. So I do know that we could cancel ends out, but it's going to give us the same limit. So I'm just not going to bother with that. Um, so anyway, so I know that uh, degrees are the same. So that's going to give me 14 over 6, which gives me 7 thirds. And that would be my limit there. Okay. So. Um, Practicing finding these sums um, and the limits of infinity of these sums is going to be important for what we do next because now we have the tools needed to solve the second basic problem of calculus, which is the area problem. Um, the problem is to find the area of the region R bounded by the graph of a non-negative continuous function F, the x-axis, and the vertical lines. Okay, so this basically is our non-negative continuous function. This is our x-axis, and then these are the vertical lines A and B. And our goal is to find the area of that R. So if R is a square, a triangle, a trapezoid, or even a semicircle, we can find its area using a, a geometric formula. But for more ge um, general regions, um, ones that are bound by polynomials, exponentials, all that kind of stuff, we have to use a different approach. Okay? So for these general regions, we have to use a different approach, one that involves the limit of summation. 
And the basic idea is to use, um, that we're gonna start with, is to use a collection of rectangles that approximates the region R, okay? Today, we're gonna start with a specific number of rectangles, but the goal is for us to make those rectangles infinitesimally small, um, but we'll deal with that after we deal with the, just a couple of rectangles. So here's how we can do this question, um, these problems for tonight's part of the assignment. It asks us to approximate the area of the region using the indicated number of rectangles of equal width. And so they give us this function, f of x equals two minus x squared. Here's that function graphed for us. Um, and remember, we're gonna use this idea that the area is the width times the height. And it's asking us to find the area um, on this interval from negative one to one. Okay. And so the first thing that we wanna do is um, we see that they have four rectangles that they're giving us. So we're going to use the area of those four rectangles to approximate this area of this region. Now notice it doesn't work exactly, okay? So notice that we have some extra stuff outside the graph. We have some stuff that's not covered inside the graph, um, but our goal is to get as close as we can, basically the area of this region that's underneath the parabola bound by the x-axis um, and two minus x squared. So the first thing that we want to do, because area is width times the height, is to find the width. So the way that we can find the width of these triangles is to take the final value, like the rightmost x value, minus our leftmost most x value that we're dealing with, and then divide by the number of rectangles. Okay, so our final value that we're, x value that we're looking at is one minus the starting x value is negative one. And see that we have four rectangles here. So we're gonna divide that by four, okay? So that gives us two. And again, that's really the distance from negative one to one, isn't it, is two. It gives us two over four, which is one half. So that tells us that we're gonna use rectangles that have a width of one half. The next thing we're going to do is try to find the height of each rectangle. Now, we want to make sure that when we have the height that we're going to use the function to get the y value. Um, if we look, the height is on the right side of the triangle. See how the left side of the, re wow, of the rectangle, the left side is not touching the function up here on the tip but the right-hand side of each rectangle is actually touching the function. So we need to make a note of that, that the height is on the right of the rectangles, which means that we're not gonna start by finding the height of at f of negative one, okay? The height of this rectangle is gonna be at f of negative one half. So we're going to find f of negative one half by substituting negative one half into the function. So I have two minus negative one half squared. That's gonna be two minus one fourth, which is seven fourths. And that's the height of that rectangle where it touches the function, okay? Now we wanna do the same thing to the next rectangle. And so the next value is at f of zero. So I have two minus zero squared, obviously that's two. The height of the next rectangle, again, it touches the function when x is one half here. So I'm gonna take f of one half. Again, that gives seven fourths. And then the fourth rectangle on the right touches the function at f of one. So now we have the heights of those four rectangles. And so let's think about what that means about the areas. The areas, remember, are width times the height. So the width of this rectangle is one half, and the height is seven fourths. 
and then that gives us the area of this rectangle. Now the um, height, wow, the width of this rectangle is one half. We found that the height of this is going to be two. The width is again one half. The height of the third rectangle is seven fourths. The height of the fourth rectangle oops, is one half. Um, the width is one half, the height is one. And in each of these cases, we want to add these together. So I got excited with the addition there. And you can find each of these and add them up. Sometimes people like to factor out the one half, like factor out the width, since the width is constant in each case, and then add all these up together, whatever you want to do. Um, if you add this together in the calculator, you get 3.25 which is 3 and 1 fourth, or 13 fourths. And that is our approximate area. So that means that our area is approximately 13 over 4, and I'll just say units squared. I can't use equal when I'm using this finite number of rectangles. Again, because we had extra, we had things that were missing, but that's going to be um, an estimate using these four rectangles, okay? So that's the process that we'll use. Find the width, use the function to find the heights, and then find the width and height, the area of each rectangle, and then add them up. Let's do one more like this. This says to use five rectangles to approximate the area of the region bounded by the graph of f of x equals six minus x squared the x-axis, and the lines x equals 0 and x equals 2. So because we're bounded by x equals 0 and x equals 2, we'll start by finding the width. So I'm going to take 2 minus 0 and divide by the number of rectangles they said to use 5. So my width is going to be 2 fifths. Okay. Now the next thing I do is find the height. Again, I see that this function is touching on the right-hand sides of the rectangles. So that means that I don't want to start finding f of 0. Do you see that 0 doesn't quite touch the graph? Um, the graph is actually going to be here at the right of that rectangle. So I want to start at x equals 2 fifths. Okay. So I'm going to find f of 2 fifths. I'm going to then, I'll just tell you what that is. If you put 2 fifths in, we get 146 over 25. Then we want to go 2 fifths further. 2 fifths further would be 4 fifths. That'll give us 134 over 25. Again, just substituting 4 fifths in for x into this equation. 2 fifths more would be um, f of 6 fifths. Um, I'll tell you that's 114 over 25. 2 more fifths would be 8 fifths. That gives 86 over 25. 2 more fifths would be 10 fifths. Well, that's good because 10 fifths is the same as 2, and if I put 2 in, then I end up getting 2. Okay. And so the next thing that I want to do is find the area. And so to find the area, what I'm going to do is, uh, we've pretty much found that I can factor out the 2 fifths, the width, and then add all these different heights together. So you could do that so that you don't need to write 2 fifths 8,000 times here. So again, this is the width times the height plus the width times the height, etc. Okay. And again, we can use our calculators to do this and we get 212 over, oops, over 25. And so that tells us that the approximate area under this region from 0 to 2, okay, 
that that's approximately 212 over 25 square units. Okay. As we increase the number of rectangles, it's, we're going to get closer and closer and closer to the actual area. And that's what we're going to be looking at um, later in this um, lesson. Um, but to kind of help us do that, I want us to generalize a little bit to get a, as a precursor to what we're going to be doing in day two. So let's actually generalize this. Um, notice that our x values for the height our first one was two-fifths, our second one was four-fifths, our third one was six-fifths, our fourth one was eight-fifths, and our fifth one was two or ten-fifths. Could we find a rule for those x value for those values? Do you notice that the numerator is double? The value that we have here over 5. So this is basically, all right, I'm going to multiply 2i and then divide it by 5, or you could say that that's 2 fifths i. Okay, and so that's the going to be for the height. So the height of each rectangle, or just kidding, the width, the width of each rectangle, Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> For us to get the specific x values that we would be substituting in. So this isn't necessarily the width, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to call these the x values for the height. Because to get the height, we're going to have to put those x values in. I'm sorry. So again, 2 fifths is our width, but we're using x is 2 fifths, x is 4 fifths, x is 6 fifths, etc. all the way through. Okay? And so then if we wanted to find the height, our rule for this one is basically f of x, which we're saying is 2 fifths i, is going to be 6 minus x squared. So that would be a rule for my height. And so essentially what we could have here is what we did is we took the sum from 1 to 5 of 2 fifths which is our width, times the height, which is 6 minus 2 fifths i squared, okay? And again, this 2 fifths on its own was always our width, okay? And then this expression here represents our height, okay? And then do you see how we have this, like, that's what I mean, like, this is the x value that we're using to help us with the height. And it's this idea that we're going to be exploring a little more as we go forward, okay? Um, so again, the goals for today were to be able to um, kind of get more familiar with these summation formulas. Um, particularly to do things like this, because we'll be working with something like this tomorrow, taking the sum um, and being able to write it as a function using these summation formulas and properties. Um, and then starting to delve into the area problem by thinking about the width times the height of several rectangles. Okay, So we will continue delving into this in our next lesson. Hope you guys have a fabulous day.